We all heard about Israeli forces flooding the Gaza tunnels. But what exactly are they? Why were they built? And how is their existence pivotal to the outcome of this war? We'll get into the flooding in just a second, but first we need to have a little history lesson to understand how the tunnels came to be in the first place. It was born out of necessity, constructed with many purposes, and made almost entirely with human hands. Let's take a look at the Gaza tunnels and how a nation was fed and a war was supplied with a line of dark, damp caves hidden 40 meters below the ground. Digging tunnels to keep people safe from the terrors of war and to keep supply lines open is a practice that's older than the Bible. Turkey is a great example. They've got tunnels and passageways so enormous that they can house thousands of people, livestock and supplies for years on end if they need to. This was thought to be a myth until a homeowner discovered the ancient underground city of Derinkuyu while he was renovating his home. The place stretches 7,000 square feet, has 18 floors, and is thought to be close to 3,000 years old. The Gaza tunnels share a lot of similarities with Derinkuyu. For one, the soft sandstone that is found in the area makes it possible to chisel out passageways by hand. It's ancient too. The first official recordings of tunnels in the area date back to 332 BC. When Alexander the Great tried to invade Palestine, it took him almost four months to overtake the city that was supposed to be an easy siege. The tunnels were so effective at hiding Palestine's inhabitants that when Alexander finally did manage to take the territory, he tried with all his might to destroy the tunnels completely. But the Palestinians did another thing that the Turks did at Derinkuyu. They hid the entrances in homes, under chicken coops, and in the back rooms of shops and food stalls. And no matter how many battles or how many tunnels enemies were able to find and destroy, a handful always managed to go undetected. When the enemies left or moved on, well, then the buckets and chisels were brought out and the Palestinians just kept on digging and extending their ancient passages. The real difference between the Gaza tunnels and Derinkuyu is that Derinkuyu didn't have the constant threat of war to keep them focused on the upkeep of the necessary haven. They quite literally forgot about the tunnels because they had a few years of peace. But Palestine never had the comfort or option to let theirs lie forgotten. For 2,000 years, those tunnels kept people alive. Food and medicine were brought in, and yes, a heck of a lot of weapons too. For two millennia, there has been constant extensions, collapses, repairs, and the uncountable number of people that have worked on them throughout the centuries stretch for generations. There are no official maps, no ancient records to go back to, and the only ones who know what's really going on there have never talked about it. There's no way to know how big they are, how many people make use of them, or how to map them. What we do know is that their use was minimal in the 1900s. Before the 80s, it was mostly used to smuggle cigarettes, fast food, and for families to visit each other without the heavy Israeli and Egyptian authorities breathing down their necks. But when Hamas was founded in 1987, they started extending their reach throughout Palestine and the Gaza tunnels. They brought the tunnels out of the realm of mere smuggling and into a bona fide city in its own right. Since their election in 2007, there have been numerous extensions. It's become so big that each section is under individual rule, each with its own taxing system and laws of passage. And with heavy sanctions and increasing shortages placed on Gaza, the underground network became the Palestinians' main stream of supplies, both for necessities like fuel and medicine, as well as weapons for war. The Israeli army discovered a few entrances, and they promptly collapsed the ones they found. And Egypt's been bulldozing openings shut for the past decade. But every time one closes, another entrance is opened again. The reality is, that the tunnels run throughout the entire Gaza Strip. 
and the only ones who truly know where they lead are Hamas themselves. The two countries that border the Gaza Strip, Egypt and Israel, have always known about the tunnels, and they closed them off every time they found them. But for the past 10 years, it really looked like Hamas was taking a step back and that it was mostly petty smuggling going on. The IDF had every Hamas leader's phone tapped and every form of communication monitored. And according to those phone calls and emails, Hamas was considering some sort of peaceful agreement with Israel. But those phone calls were all rehearsed. The real communications between Hamas leaders that had taken refuge in other countries and the Hamas operatives back home were done old school style. Human messengers and handwritten notes were passed back and forth through the Egyptian entrances. If a Hamas agent could make it into Egypt undetected, the information he carried was as good as secure. So for the past 10 years, one message and one shipment at a time, Hamas has created a sizable arsenal stored right under Gaza. The attack on the music festival in October was only executed once they had enough weaponry stocked up to get them through the first leg of a full-on war. To put this into perspective, consider the sheer amount of dedication that this would have taken. If the object being brought in couldn't be hidden on a person or in their luggage, it needed to be dismantled, brought in piece by piece, and reassembled after many individuals smuggled that weapon's parts in over the course of time. They couldn't exactly pull trucks up to the openings and offload tons of ammunition and RPGs all at once. No, this was done in the dead of night using men, women, and children, a highly organized system of discreet and die-hard believers in the cause designed to build a stockpile for the future. Now you'd think that bombing the whole of Gaza would be the answer. If Israel creates enough vibrations in the ground, the soft stone that's already saturated with groundwater will crumble like a sand castle under a toddler's foot. But there are entire families living under there. Hostages are being held there. And no one can say for sure what kinds of weapons are hidden in that maze. The disruption could set off enough explosives to detonate so violently that it could stretch into Israel and Egypt for all we know. Even if Israel were willing to blow it all to hell, the UN and the various countries that have their own people held hostage there would never allow it. A move that bold will have Israeli support pulling out, and Israel needs all the support they can get when they're surrounded by hostile nations from all sides. But with the tunnels intact, this war is going to stretch for decades more. Hamas has all of their eggs in the Gaza tunnels, and Israel knows that they need to destroy them if they're going to get the upper hand. So they did the next best thing outside of bombing them, flooding it with water instead. They got the idea from Egypt. In the past, Egypt has drilled wells right through the tunnels to cut them off, but Hamas just dug under them. They then pumped raw sewage into the openings, but the people inside put on some boots and went about their business anyway. Then, Egypt built fish farms along the tunnel entrances in 2015. They did this under the guise of aquatic agriculture, but in truth, they were flooding miles and miles of tunnels. This was a devastating blow to both Hamas and the people in Gaza who worked in the tunnels, relied on them for daily supplies, and kept in contact with family on the outside. It took years to get the tunnels back to full operation. Now, the IDF didn't just flood the lot all in one go. That would be too dangerous. Pump too much water in at once, and innocent people will drown. Also, since the tunnels crisscross throughout the whole of Gaza, there's the high likelihood that it will cause the whole strip to collapse, placing the people in the tunnels below and those still above in a great deal of danger. Opinions are mixed. Half the world is in favor of this move. It genuinely seems to be the safest possible route to take, giving civilians the best chance of survival. Israel did not go in with the intent to drown everyone down there. If anything, their approach is very, very tentative. 
This first stream from the Mediterranean is a good way to test the waters, so to speak, with minimal loss of life. But others can test the idea. They're worried about the infrastructure of Gaza above, and they wonder whether or not the massive amounts of salt water will leave permanent changes to the natural aquifers. Gaza's water is supplied by Israel, and what little they do have is in underground reserves. The salt water is sure to change the quality of that water, maybe even permanently. Then there's still the weapons that are stored down there. If they're abandoned and left to the elements, not only could they detonate now, they could also get buried under tons of mud, making it almost impossible to find later. Whoever lives above the old tunnels, if the war ever does end, will be living right over a ticking time bomb. So they targeted one entrance for the first round, sending in a torrent of knee-deep seawater. This is just enough to render the tunnels uninhabitable, but it also makes it possible for people to wade out. The intent is to flush out Hamas, hostages and civilians, forcing them to fight above ground and the opportunity to separate the innocents from the armed soldiers. Reports aren't in yet, at least not any confirmed ones, but we do know that the IDF is stationed at every entrance that they do know of in the vicinity, waiting for people to flee from the flood. Now only time will tell how effective it was. If they decide to flood another tunnel, at least we'll know that there was some success on Israel's end of the spectrum and little to no loss of life, Otherwise, their allies won't allow them to continue. But there's always the possibility that the IDF will do what they see fit, regardless of what the US and the UN have to say about it. One thing is certain, without those tunnels, Hamas is in serious trouble. They just can't compete with the IDF on open ground, even if they do manage to get their entire arsenal out before it can be buried. And now we pose the question to our viewers. Is the collapse of the tunnel system the end of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Or do you think that Israel will cause too many lives to be lost and be forced by the rest of the UN to back out from flooding any more tunnels? There is no denial. The Gaza tunnels are the backbone of Hamas's game plan. And if it's lost, the war is too. Or do you think there's another master plan brewing from somewhere else? Let us know in the comments below. And you know the drill, leave a like and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on the hot take on the geopolitical affairs of the day. See you next time, cheers.